I have Ed Calabrese here. My presentation today is going to be the historical foundations of the linear non-threshold LNT dose response model for cancer risk assessment. But it's really going to be about how LNT was born and sustained. And it's a story of mistakes, deceptions, and failed public policy. And that actually is being a bit too kind. And as you'll see as we get further into it. Now, it is a history, and it is science. And science and history, it's really where humans play. And this is a game of uh, personalities and how personalities affected the science, their decisions. And all these names that you see in front of you, they're, they're actually great people. They did uh, enormous uh, good in the scientific community. And we're going to see that they're also human. And they also, uh, not all of them, but uh, some of them, you know, made, I think, some missteps along the way. Some of them are serious missteps. And, um, and we'll try to put things in context and to try to be as accurate as possible in terms of what they really did and what it means and, and where things uh, went off the rails for a while. And I want you to see what these people look like because they're actually real people. None of them really are alive today. Um, the latest one, uh, most recent to die, was John uh, Goffman about 15 years ago. Uh, but we'll take a look at their, them all right now. This is uh, uh, the person with the longest reach, uh, Herman Muller. And we'll come back to him quite a bit. Nobel Prize winner in 1946, radiation genetics. Uh, you'll see Muller here. He was a rather short man compared to the, uh, uh, the King of Sweden. But you see him getting his Nobel Prize. And then we have Kurt Stern uh, lecturing and plays a very critical role in radiation genetics, the Manhattan Project, and many other things. Colleague, close colleague of Russ, of, uh, of Herman Muller. And here we have Warren Spencer, who was uh, integral to the Manhattan Projects. We will hear his name. A uh, nice young picture of uh, Warren Spencer. Here we have Ernst Kasperi, a uh, central figure in the Manhattan Project. Uh, here we have Delta Uphoff. Again, uh, a critical person, dies in 1992 of breast cancer. Um, but this was uh, Delta. Here we have Warren Weaver, who was the director of research at the uh, Rockefeller um, Institute. And he was the chair of the uh, Bayer One Genetics Panel, a very key player in selecting who was on that panel and, and what the final products looked like. Here's a, a member of that uh, Bayer One panel and a Caltech professor and a 1958 Nobel Prize winner, key person in this, George W. Beadle. Here we have William Russell. Uh, he will have uh, a leading role in multiple aspects here. And you'll hear also a lot about his wife, uh, Leanne Russell. The, the two made a, a powerful uh, genetics couple. Uh, here we have uh, Louis J. Stadler, near Nobel Prize winner three times, um, and proved to be uh, Muller's um, Muller's equal in whatever he did, and perhaps uh, even more than his equal, as you will see. Here we have perhaps the most creative uh, geneticist of the 20th century, Barbara McClintock, and we'll hear uh, her role in this story as well. Uh, Nikolay uh, Timof Brzezowski, um, he plays a critical role in uh, the uh, creation of the first LNT single hit model. Uh, Max Stelbreck, another Nobel Prize winner, um, along with uh, Rosofsky, uh, is, is part of the creation of the first quantitative LNT model. Edward Lewis, 1957 paper, really turned uh, a big focus on uh, LNT and leukemia. And again, another Nobel Prize winner. Um, mm -hmm another uh, radiation geneticist. Here we have John Goffman. Um, he deserves four pictures of himself, actually. <laughs> you can see the human aging process here, how he was when he was a young professor at uh, Berkeley and how he, uh, uh, how he looked when he was in his mid eighties, late eighties. And so, um, and in between. Goffman um, is an amazing story in and of himself but is central to this, uh, uh, the modernization of the debate over LNT. Um, these are some of the key players. They're real. 
Um, they, they bleed and they're all very, very talented in their own way. And we'll see how they, they got along, how they didn't get along and, and, um, and, and things of that nature. I want to show you the historical framework of this, uh, LNT model to let you think that even though this is an historical, um, evaluation, that this history actually, um, continues to the present time. And it really it starts with Mueller in 1927, and it uh, leads off with his being the first to produce what he called gene mutations. And then it goes all the way to uh, 2023, in which uh, there is considerable challenging of LNT based upon uh, a, a lot of these uh, historical issues and, and recent discoveries uh, coming to fruition. Uh, here is the same uh, slide, so to speak, but with some uh, red uh, words put in, red lettering words put in, in which we have identified certain types of key developments during these time periods, which I'll explain as we go forth. Now, in terms of getting to the story itself, well, LNT was really created by Herman Muller. And and this is a story of, as I mentioned, uh, flawed science and mistakes and 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 failed policy. And and actually, the LNT story starts with actually two big mistakes that Mueller made. It's what I call risk assessments original sin. And so, what was risk assessments original sin? Well, it actually uh, was that Mueller got the concept of evolution wrong. And then he integrated this mistake into the risk assessment process. And you may never have, have heard of uh, evolution and risk assessment, but these are gonna be linked at the, at the hip. Um, and so how did this mistake actually happen? Now you have to picture yourself as Mueller. He's a graduate student at Columbia, and it uh, goes there about 1910, 1911. And he is working with this uh, future Nobel Prize winner, surprise, surprise, Thomas Hunt Morgan, his advisor. And, and they're trying to understand the causes and the significance of mutation. And they're using the fruit fly as their model. And they do see some visual mutations. For example, a red-eyed fruit fly might become a white-eyed fruit fly. They may see some change in a a wing structure or some uh, antenna structure, something like that. But picture this, they're studying mutations. And over the course of many years, number of years, and with a number of people studying fruit flies and knowing how they can reproduce massively, uh, in observations that Muller and others estimated to be about 20 to 25 million fruit flies, just picture this, they reported seeing only about 400 mutations, visual mutations, out of 20 to 25 million flies. It's, it's, it's about one in 50,000. It's really very rare. I mean, it's extremely rare. And so according to, to Muller and how he would write, he just noted that it seemed impossible to induce mutation, but but what could have been the cause of evolution except for gene mutation? It, it had There had to be something here by which this could uh, occur. But what Muller concluded, his basic, uh, his basic understanding was that when you only see 400 mutations out of 20 to 25 million flies, then you, you have to conclude that the genome is extremely stable. And that was, that's what Muller concluded. He didn't have too many people that disagreed with him. I don't know of anybody who disagreed with him. Okay, and you can see this little comment. This is uh, X number of years later, after he makes his big breakthrough discovery in 1927. But in a, in a summary sort of review paper, Muller says this, and it's really interesting and shows his, shows his little shop personality as well. It says, in the course of this work, animals and plants have been drugged, poisoned, intoxicated, etherized, illuminated, kept in darkness, half smothered, painted inside and out, whirled around and round, shaken violently, vaccinated, mutilated, educated, and treated with everything except affection. 
from generation to generation, but their genes seemed to remain oblivious and they could not be distracted into making an obvious mistake or mutation. In other words, this is telling you they tried really hard to induce gene mutations. They did everything ex except throw the kitchen sink at them, and they may have done that as well. And it's very difficult to do this. And so, but Mullen knew that the only way that you could come up with an explanation for evolution, you had to find a way that nature had induced gene mutation to have this great diversity of life and the progression that um, we see within the context of biological evolution. And so we'll get into this a bit more. But in 1927, Muller eventually induces these gene mutations using very high doses of radiation. Now, and I mean very high doses, and, and we'll get into it, but there was a person, his name was Mavor, who was uh, researching contemporary with Muller, who was very close to this mutation claim. And he was using extremely high doses of radiation to induce crossing over um, exchanges between chromosomes and not actual gene mutation. And he was using a such a high dose that he was actually sterilizing about 90% of his fruit flies. And so when Muller decided to use x-rays, he pretty much adopted the dosing scheme of this guy, Mavor. And so Muller never used, nor did he intend to use, low doses of radiation. Muller knew that there was almost no chance to induce gene mutation, and he better use as high a dose as possible. And so Muller was using a dose that would be killing lots of his fruit flies, um, sterilizing many others, and and uh, whoever didn't get sterilized was one of the the, the low percentage few that that, that, that didn't. But uh, that so Muller was always using very very high doses. Okay, and it came out of that that Mavor research in 1929. Muller writes after his major finding that he gets this paper in Science where he 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 reports the artificial transmutation of the gene. And Muller writes that in this 1929 review paper, he said that he has found at least one of the natural causes of mutation and hence of evolution. This was the prize. This was really the prize. He, he needs to try to figure out what is the driving engine for evolution and indicating that background radiation was a cause of evolution. And the only way that he could really get to this was by some sort of uh, linear extrapolation down to background and below. The only way he could make that claim was to assert linearity at low doses, even though Muller exposed his fruit flies in his lab at Texas to ionizing radiation at a rate of 100 million, and I mean 100 million, uh, fold greater than background. I mean, when we talk about twofold, tenfold, a hundredfold greater than background, a thousandfold greater than background, you may begin to start to think that that's kind of a high dose. A uh, hundred thousandfold, a millionfold. Muller was giving these mice a hundred millionfold greater than background dose rate. For Muller, natural mutations, those scattered and very infrequent, were sufficient with natural selection taking control to decide the fate of organisms. It's very interesting here, uh, as we're going to talk about it. Uh, Muller never identifies the possibility that uh, the genes had the capacity to repair themselves once damaged. So let's summarize or look at in greater detail his actual mistakes. The first mistake is uh, the genome is highly unstable. The, the genome... Uh, actually is and now is known to be highly unstable. A vast numbers of mutations occur each second in each day, each, uh, each uh, cell, but they get repaired. Repair is so rapid that you can't tell that there was a mutation. So Muller is looking at, at fruit flies and he doesn't see gene mutation and he concludes that it's stable. But actually what we now know is that there is so much damage taking place every single second in every single cell but our capacity is so efficient that we don't actually understand that we're undergoing such uh, rapid damage repair, damage repair, damage repair. And Muller comes up with this idea that, that, oh, evolution works by damage and natural selection, and he doesn't, he leaves out this concept of repair. And 
and and and even though he could not have known it at that time, but I would I would challenge you to say, well, if you saw um, these 400 mutations out of 25 million fruit flies, you might say the genome is stable. And I could say, yes, that's an hypothesis. But what else could explain this? You could still see those 400 out of 25 million by saying it's possible that there was massive damage taking place. But there was a repair process that in the end resulted in 400 mutations out of 25 million. Uh, either, either one could be right. Their hypotheses. Muller's mistake was that he, in fact, only offered one hypothesis, that background radiation induces mutation. There is no repair. Natural selection kicks in and operates. He needed to propose several competing hypotheses, but he failed to do so. And Muller being Muller, a very persuasive uh, person, big leader, uh, major discoverer of what he believed were actual gene mutations, the field actually eventually adopted this view. And, and that was the view that there was a genome was stable, there was no repair. And that becomes a very big factor in deciding the adoption of LNT. And it's passed on. And so we now can swing back and take a look at, well, what did Mueller actually uh, discover? What did he win his Nobel Prize for? Well, he gets his Nobel Prize for, in fact, um, uh, being said anyways, that he produced uh, gene mutation. Well, actually, he didn't induce gene mutations. He induced mostly massive gene deletions. Many notable geneticists actually disputed Muller on this topic. And during the course of this um, great dispute, significant limitations in his arguments and data were shown. And Muller was eventually proven wrong with modern nucleotide measurements. And so his great mut mutation discovery really wasn't so great. And Muller got a Nobel Prize for which he didn't deserve, actually. Uh, other people had shown... Uh, gene deletions and rearrangements and all kinds of uh, um, macro chromosomal changes that could affect uh, phenotypic expression in the next generation. And Muller always discounted those as not being significant because Muller said, oh, mutation that affects evolution has to be small micro changes. Muller introduced the, the term uh, point mutation in his 1927 paper. And Muller... Uh, it's 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 quite interesting, and we'll go back into this a little bit further, but when Muller wrote his paper and published it in Science, I was quite interested in, obviously, this paper. I went to find the paper, eventually got the paper, wanted to see just what was the kind of data that he actually had. And so, but as it turns out, the interesting thing with, with Muller's major breakthrough paper in Science in 1927, July 22nd, 1927, is that there was no data in the paper. And he, yet he makes his claim that he has, in fact, produced the artificial transmutation of the gene. So I'm saying, how did Muller get a paper in science without any data? How does he get it in on the most important topic of the time? Just, I mean, I have tried many times to get papers in science, maybe 70 times at this stage of my long career in academic life. I'd have to share with the audience I'm actually batting zero for 70. Uh, I did in 2003, that big story was run on me on my work on hormesis, and they had a five-page story with my picture in the paper, in the, in the journal, but it wasn't actually my article. It was just a, sto a story about, about what I was doing. But Muller gets his paper in with no data. So how does he do this? So how does Muller paper? And, and so what, what was the deal? Well, as it turns out, something that you should know is that the editor-in-chief, um, was uh, a former professor at Columbia and was uh, in the psychology department and was very, very close friends with Muller's advisor, Thomas Hunt Morgan. And as it turns out, his uh, the professor had, had a daughter who was Muller's age, who was also a graduate student in Thomas Hunt Morgan's lab and co-published several papers with Muller's advisor doing mutation research. So Muller knew the daughter, Muller knew the, knew the professor, and and... He and Thomas M. Morgan um, co-published papers, pa several papers in uh, uh, journals that uh, the uh, the editor was the owner of the science journal was the editor in chief and owner of. So they had they had a relationship. 
what I discovered um, best by uh, by sheer luck is that I, I bought many uh, thousands of papers between Mueller and his uh, colleagues and um, the colleagues amongst themselves and so forth. And 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 as it turns out, in a letter that Mueller wrote in on I think it was July twenty sixth of 1927, about a month after he came back from presenting his Nobel Prize work over in Europe, uh, he writes a letter to uh, um, the director of the uh, Carnegie Institute genetics uh, program, uh, Dr. Demarek. And he asked Demarek the following question. He said that he'd been asked by the the editor of science, uh, the actually the editor of science, but was the editor also of an owner of the American Naturalist, another major journal, the American Naturalist, that uh, that uh, this this editor wanted to republish papers that were presented at the major uh, genetics congress in Berlin that Mueller made his big presentation at, and that he had given Mueller the authority to uh, to uh, approach. Uh, people who made interesting papers, and to invite them to submit these papers to the American Naturalist, and that the editor and owner of that journal gave Mueller the uh, authority to accept uh, any papers um, that and, and would be published, therefore, in that journal, and therefore they would get their uh, their research uh, greatly expanded because the American Naturalist was a pretty uh, widely accepted and and excellent publication. And the conference proceeding was only going to be seen by very few. And so I have that letter. And that letter to me told, well, well, who would actually go and do this for this editor? And why would they take all this time to to uh, write to dozens and dozens of people, asking them to submit papers, then taking the time to review those papers and going back and forth with these authors, and then making the decisions on whether these papers will get accepted or not? That's an awful lot of work. And so and it made me wonder whether this was part of a quid pro quo between Mueller and the editor of Science for how they worked the deal to get his paper in. Now, I, I don't have any final confirmation on that, but I have looked and looked and looked to see what was the possible deal between the two to get a paper in Science, because getting the paper in Science proved to be very big, because what actually happened was that Mueller um, gets his work published without peer review. Mueller doesn't know this exactly, but he knows that there are three or four groups that are competing with him to be the first to show gene mutation. And and as it turns out, the closest is about three months behind him. That's like a blink of an eye. It's very, it's very short time. If you submit a paper to, to science, reviewers could say, well, you have to go back and do two or three more experiments. You have to do additional extra work you, you, he could have actually lost his position. And and if you came in second, guess what? Second is the first loser when it comes to getting the Nobel Prize or, or, or other, other kinds of things. And so and he was going for the prize. And so what Mueller did was by getting a paper published in the top journal in the world at that time on the most critical topic, he really went around the rules of the game. He didn't play fair with the other people who were competing with him, and he worked a deal out. Uh, I think he worked this deal out, and so whatever it was, and then, and it's also very interesting too. Um, this this conference proceedings was never peer reviewed itself, and so Mueller had his Nobel Prize work showed no data for science presented at a conference proceedings in Berlin, and. And actually, the, the paper that he read was exactly the paper that was published with no changes made. And so what and, and, and this paper was was uh, not well put together. This paper did not have a methods and materials. This paper did not cite any references. It had no discussion of any other research that was going on. Uh, even if it was of Nobel Prize quality, it never would have been just published as is. It would have been thrown back at him to say, you have to conform to, to the standards. We want our methods and materials. We want to know how to reproduce your work. We want to know how that work relates to what other people have done in the literature. Mullet provided none of that, gets his paper in. And, and so what we find is that Mueller avoids peer review and he escapes criticisms. 
never cites the works of others on gene mutation prior to his own work. And there were claims of gene mutation before his own work, six months before in uh, the Journal of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by two New York uh, area uh, geneticists. Uh, and Muller never cites them. And I'd have to say Muller's best friend, Edgar Altenberg, you can see in this quote below, uh, which Muller actually cites in, in one of his publications, uh, he, he asked Herman Muller, his best friend, Herman, did you just blow holes in the chromosomes? He says, what's your proof? And so, and, and that was Muller's best friend. And it's, he wasn't the only one thinking along those lines. There were others who were, and it became um, the next decade would, would be a lot of intense criticism of Muller's interpretation. Yes, he had produced uh, transgenerational phenotypic changes, color changes. I mean, he's really looking at, at uh, sex-linked traits and looking at whether, um, to, for the most part, whether males lived or died in the next generation. But as it turns out, um, that was really the, the, the key focus that he had but but in in essence uh, you had to to come up with actually mechanistic proof that it was at the gene level and and as it turns out um as in, and we will get into this a little bit further um the data really stacked up that it was not going to support Muller's interpretation and, and how did he respond to that well as it turns out uh, Muller knew when he came back from, from his trip that he needed to better understand the nature of the dose response. So he got two groups of individuals to do two separate projects in his lab uh, using extremely high doses of radiation. Um, at the lowest dose is about 25 to 30 million uh, fold dose rate greater than background. And in both of these uh, uh, two studies, they actually supported a linear interpretation. And based upon his misunderstanding of evolution, these two supportive findings, Muller in 1930 created the term called the proportionality rule. Um, and, and this is really the, the first term that I've ever seen for where the concept of linearity really uh, comes out of. So it's uh, Muller, 1930, and that phrasing of it became uh, kind of a niche, a niche kind of a thing, not really wide known in the scientific community, but known amongst the radiation geneticists. Now, this evolutionary theory in LNT, and this, this proportionality rule, LNT, was really born out of a need to explain evolution. Evolution was the cardinal central belief. Muller concluded that LNT must be the fundamental dose response for radiation-induced mutation. For Muller, the only way that evolution could work was via gene mutation from background radiation, required linearity at low doses, and no repair. Thus, the birth of LNT, the original, said if you had repair, given how infrequent mutation was, and Muller thought there wouldn't have been enough mutations to even have evolution. So you really had to even discount the possibility of repair. And it was just a, a neo-Darwinian interpretation and, and and ultimately that becomes very significant because Muller goes to Germany in 1933, works with some well-known radiation geneticists like Rosowski, uh, but also with with a really great group of um, physicists. And two of these physicists linked up with Rosowski, and they created the first ever mechanistic model for LNT, 1935. And it was the single hit mechanism, and it was based on target theory. They were trying to figure out um, the size of the gene, the nature of the damage, things of this nature. And they, they, and they linked the, the uh, descriptive dose response aspects of, of the Muller and Rosowski data into uh, a physics-based uh, target theory perspective. And, and this accounted for the linear-based uh, 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 response um, tied into uh, the, the uh, gene target. The problem with the model was it was wrong from the start. It was based upon Muller's incorrect gene mutation conclusion. He assumed, this model assumed no genetic repair. It was, it was uh, they had uh, the wrong kind of damage and they, and they failed to uh, 
to even have any consideration built in for our potential for, for damage. Yet this single hit a model was the model that was passed three or four generations, three or four decades later that on to EPA in the 1970s and was the, the foundation for when they went to LNT. And it was ill-founded and it came right out of this 1935 paper. Now, as it turns out, in the 1930 uh, decade, 1930 to 1940, evidence mounted that Mueller had induced uh, massive gene deletions and not mutations. And it was coming in from a variety of different methodological approaches. And Mueller actually could not counter this challenge. And and the person who was leading the, the challenge against Mueller's perspective was um, Lewis Stadler, whose picture that I showed earlier. And Stadler uh, stated that Mueller had confused an observation with a mechanism. And and and, it, and I got copies of all the grant proposals between that Mueller had in the 1930s and Stadler. And they were they were two chess masters battling with each other out. And as it turns out, in this battle of very brainy radiation geneticists, um, to see who could topple the other's king. As it turns out, uh, Stadler and Mueller, both at the top of their game, but but Stadler's uh, uh, decision-making and execution was always, in my opinion, somewhat better than Mueller's and boxed him into a, a corner and reduced his his capacity to to give any sort of robustness to his explanations. And, 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 and in his... Uh, it's a biography of Mueller written in 1981 by his last graduate student. And the graduate student, uh, this is a, I'm not sure wherever this has ever been mentioned, but the graduate student mentioned, uh, at that time he's then a professor at California, he mentioned that Mueller had, uh, had become highly doubtful that he had actually induced gene mutation uh, because his belief system was being eroded by the work of Staller and others. And so Mueller... Uh, Mueller was was losing uh, standing in this in this debate, and so Mueller needed to do something. He just could not. He just couldn't win in this battle against uh, against Stadler and some others. And so, as it turns out, Mueller's a smart guy, and Mueller says, "Well, I mean, I can't keep playing the same play again. I have to go and do something different if I'm going to get I'm going to win this thing." And so Mueller comes up with a new way to try to throw Stadler off his back, and he does this by saying i'm gonna i'm gonna see what determines uh um radiation risk is it total dose or is it dose rate and the total dose is is really what i call the um the piggy bank theory the te and and that is that every single amount of damage that you get it's like a piggy bank it just keeps adding up and adding up and doesn't go away and adds to a total so if you have a penny every day after 100 days you have a dollar okay it adds up and so the dose rate is uh, is basically uh, that where the damage doesn't add up, that the that there is a capacity to repair that damage, unless that capacity is overwhelmed. That way you'd, you'd have some low steady state, but you wouldn't keep rising as when this, it's like you're spending part of your allowance every week. It's not going to add up to a dollar very quickly after 100 days. And so since, so since he was losing the gene mutation argument, Mueller undertook an experimental initiative to test this uh, mutation explanation and LNT, and it was uh, conducted at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland in 1938 to 1939, just prior to World War II. So a very difficult time there. Now, this becomes significant. Why? Because Muller's in, in bad shape when this happens, and in the conceptual sense and emotionally as well. Uh, he's been losing a lot of uh, battles with Statler and others. And so he needs to find a way to revitalize both the uh, that he produced gene mutation and that the LNT idea is correct. So what he does is he gets a student um, to do a study on uh, total dose versus dose rate. And and so in this in this study, what what they really did was they gave a, a large dose of radiation and it measured a certain amount of mutation. And then they took that same dose, but they spread it out over the course of the, the three or four weeks that the fruit fly, fruit fly lives, so that the, it would have the same dose after the three or four weeks, it would add up to the total that they all gave within a couple, uh, a few seconds. And so, in, and, and Mueller would conclude that, well, if it's total, if it's the piggy bank theory, 
our total dose, then the damage should be the same. If it's the dose rate, then then um, it'll never add up to this total dose. Well, as it turns out, the student actually gets data that supports Muller's hypothesis. It was really, to me, pretty shocking, uh, but it supported Muller's interpretation. And so, and, and that led him to conclude that mutations were not repairable and were cumulative. And Muller, <clears throat> this is part of the story, Muller actually gets um, this particular um, paper published again in the non-peer-reviewed literature, publishes it in a conference proceeding that's not peer-reviewed. And, and he proclaims this uh, widely as supporting his position. And as it turns out, um, almost nobody ever, re I don't know of anybody who ever criticized it except me, and, my, and I'm criticizing it 70 years later, right? And, and this study had very serious uh, limitations, and it needed replication. And, and I've gone into the, the story of Muller and, and this student, and there were really um, many flaws. These were, some were missed, I'm sure, and some were hidden, never revealed. Now, just for example, uh, I'll first start off by saying that the student was not trained in Drosophila geneticist, genetics. Muller taught him how to do uh, crosses between some of the different strains, and they needed to have pure homozygous strains of of um, fruit flies that they wanted to test to try to reduce their variability. Um, to just study one, you know, one one variable, which would be the the differences in the radiation exposure. And Muller Muller <laughs> taught the, the 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 person how to make the crosses, and then Muller actually took off um, in May of well, I think it was 1939. Uh, and and he came to the United States, and he didn't return until early October. The student's entire work was done without Muller being present, okay? And I have their letters between them, but, and the student, when he writes to Muller, a number of these letters are are just desperation calls. I'm not doing very well. You, you said it was going to be difficult to learn how to do crossing, and he said, I'm not sure I can, I can do this, Uh he says, I, I hope I can, but I, I'm not, I don't have any confidence. And when I, and then I, I look, and then he shares data with Mala in these letters, and, and he shows that he has all kinds of mixed genetic crosses in certain percentages, and he could never come up with pure homozygous strains. And when he distributes these, these, um, the, these uh, fruit flies across his treatment groups, he has mixed genetic backgrounds, differing in varying relative percentages, introduces a, an uncontrolled second variable into his, uh, more than multiple variables actually, into his, into his study. And, and it's never, and the interesting thing is, that's never reported in the dissertation. It's never reported in the paper. I get it because I get the letters between them, and it's hidden. It's actually hidden from the scientific community. It's very, very interesting. And then he, he pilots his work by studying strain X to see how sensitive it is to radiation and the dietary schemes they want to use. And then when he does his research, he doesn't do the work with the strain X. He uses strain Y. And then when he uses strain Y, strain Y failed the test because it, it wasn't able to, to uh, de essentially detect two different types of uh, endpoints, a mutation and a translocation uh, variable. Uh, at the same time, because there were two genetic endpoints. And so halfway during the study, he throws that that uh, model out and he replaces it with another model that wasn't piloted, introduces a second um, a, a, a second dietary change. He has so many different uh, um, so many different methodological problems. These really, for the most part, are never mentioned, you know, in the dissertation in, in or, or in other, publications. Um, I find them in in, uh, in in notes. I find them in in correspondence and other kinds of things. And and when Muller presents this or the student, it's presented like, oh, oh, it's beautiful. It's perfect. It holds together. And one of the other interesting things here is that to, that I found, and that was that you know he's dealing with radium, and radium gives off um, a gamma rays. And if you have your your control group and your treatment group uh, in the same room, which is what they did in, in the Manhattan Project, 
and then they're too uh, in close proximity to each other. In the Manhattan Project, they had to put a lead shield between the control group and the treated group, so the the radium that's being giving off the gamma rays would not pass through uh, the container um, shield container in the uh, uh, for the uh, the control group and cause mutational damage. So they put the lead shield in the lead shield and in the in the Manhattan Project was 99% effective. You might think that's good. We'll talk about that. But even if it was 90, 99% effective, and if it was used in the uh, uh, Edinburgh studies, the control group I calculated would still have received 24 rads of radiation. It's a massive dose to the, con to the control group. They never mentioned in the dissertation, they never mentioned in the papers uh, where the, where the uh, incubators were, they never mentioned if they had a lead shield. You have no understanding of this. If you if you assume they had a lead shield, then they still would have had 24 rads of radiation. If they didn't have a lead shield and they were together, it would have been a gigantic. Multiply that by 100. I mean, it would have been a considerable difference. So th this is very significant. But Mueller uses this, this study, which is terribly flawed, and the flaws being hidden until... Our discussions really today uh, and some uh, recent papers that I've published, and ne they never reported. This study revitalized his uh, um, his career, you might say, and it actually, I think, played a significant role in him getting the Nobel Prize. And then when he goes to um, to receive his Nobel Prize, he stands up in front of the Nobel audience and he uses this study and praises it for, you know, it, it's supporting um, his mutation uh, discovery and the linear dose response relationship. And he uses this study, he cites this study for saying why you have to reject the um, currently in vogue threshold model. And it was, it was a very, uh, um, in my opinion, um, certainly wrong. It may have been intellectually very, uh, um, deceptive and it may have even been worse than that you know when you're really trying to characterize what's going on but did anybody actually go in and dig out the details no they accepted what Mueller had to say so Mueller um as world war ii was was starting Mueller had to leave edinburgh when he came to the united states and no place would really offer him a job because he was somewhat of a brilliant guy in many ways but he was cantankerous and difficult to work with. At least that was the general view. And so, as it turns out, Muller got one offer, and he got the offer from the town that I'm living in right now and have worked in for 50 years, Amherst, Massachusetts. But not I'm at the University of Massachusetts. He got this job at Amherst College, which is one mile from where I'm sitting at the present time. And he got the job because a former friend, graduate student of his, um, uh, Thomas Plop was uh, a professor uh, in the biology department at Amherst College and and with the faculty being drafted and things of this for the war, he was able to bring Muller in for a uh, an appointment that lasted from 1940 to 1945. And so while at Amherst, Muller continued his, his research with fruit flies and the like, but uh, Kurt Stern, whose picture you saw earlier, had uh, migrated from from Germany to uh, the United States and was a professor at the University of Rochester. And Rochester had many good um, radiation biologists and scientists there, and they got some massive grants and contracts from the Atomic Energy Commission to take a look at the genetic impacts of uh, radiation, especially with respect to uh, worker uh, health and safety and other kinds of issues. And so the genetics component of that was going to have two aspects to it. Uh, one was going to be using the mouse model, uh, and the other was going to be the use of uh, the fruit fly under the uh, leadership of Kurt Stern. The mouse model, as you can see, was by Don Charles. As it turns out, you might think that, well, gee, they're going to have uh, 400,000 mice that, that Charles used. Uh, this is going to actually lead to some real great insights when it comes to human risk assessment, because now we have a mammalian model. Well, as it turns out, 400 mice yielded no meaningful publications 
by Charles's group. Now, this research was started in 1942-43, and by the entire time of the war, there were, there were no reports. In 1950, there was one report. It was a two-page, um, maybe three, uh, summary of, of all the past work, but nothing meaningful. And then in 1954, Charles uh, dies of a suicide in a downtown Manhattan um, hotel room. And then uh, 1961, some of the remnants of his friends got together, got some federal money, and they said, can we put together something that came from all our work and what 20 years ago started almost on, on the uh, Manhattan Project? And they put together a paper, and they had to acknowledge they were missing much data, and they had... They did the best they could and science to pass them by. And they had no meaningful results, actually no meaningful results on mice from the Manhattan Project. It was active, very, in today's world, that would be viewed as pretty highly scandalous. And so all eyes turned to the Stern research, which was uh, going to be with Drosophila. And it was the only, it was the only one left standing. And we'll see what actually happened. So it's going to become highly significant. And it did become highly significant and affected our beliefs today in national policy on dose response. So let's see what we actually have here. This acute study was going to be what Mueller, Mueller convinced uh, Stern, and I have this in letters, uh, that he needed to replicate this study in Edinburgh. Now, that may mean that Mueller had some reservations about the quality of the study. Um, but he kept it to himself, other than the fact that Mueller admitted in a letter to Stern that the that the genetic crosses that the graduate student did actually were far from pure and that they needed to improve on 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 that angle. Well, what happened is he was going to do this total dose versus dose rate. It's going to be much bigger and better, not just one graduate student, but a whole team going to work together. And under the leadership on the acute side of Warren Spencer, um, working uh, the, with Kurt Stern, and and in and this would be done in 1943 to 45, and then there would be a follow-up study. There would be the acute study in which they would titrate the dose out and try to see if you get the same amount of damage between the acute and the chronic study. Well, as it turns out, this Warren Spencer study, just like what happened in um, in Edinburgh. He got a beautiful linear dose response relationship, and uh, and people thought this was a really great study, and and but as it turns out, again nobody criticizes the study except me. So I go in, you know, 60, 70 years later, I go to look at it, and I notice, well, gee, this um, this study has very poor temperature control. It's inconsistent uh, in its uh, instrument collaboration, extremely inconsistent. The poor matching of control groups and treatments across experimental days and months. Um, uh, they com This is interesting, too. They combined treatments. They've got the same total dose, but different dose rates. Now, let's see what we're trying to figure out in this study. We're trying to figure out a total dose versus dose rate hypothesis, right? A piggy bank theory. And, and so what they do in this study for in the low-dose zone is that they take they take their animals that have the same total dose and different dose rates and combine them in their analysis, and so that you can't actually even test that hypothesis. Uh, I mean, I'm reading this and I'm saying, surely somebody must have re peer reviewed this paper. Somebody must have read it and realized that this is a self contradiction. And then I said, well, well, wait a minute now. Where did they publish the paper? Where did Kurt Stern and Warren Spencer publish? They published it on a great journal. The journal's called Genetics. It's a really great journal. Then I said, well, well, who was the editor-in-chief of Genetics at the time that they published the paper? Oh, it was Kurt Stern, the co-author of the paper. Oh, I said, well, that's kind of interesting. I said, so when did they submit this paper and how quickly was it published? Well, they submitted it on... November 25th of 1947, and was published in January, the first week in January of 1948. It was a 70-page paper. You know, in snail mail and everything else, it wasn't peer-reviewed. I have found no evidence that it was peer-reviewed. And so what happened is they took this study, and they, <laughs> it was done, directed by uh, Stern, the editor-in-chief of genetics, 
uh, has some uh, serious fatal flaws to it and gets it published and it becomes a fundamental uh, paper used to support LNT. Okay. This is, and, and I'm being kind and I'm being kind. Okay. So now the next thing was, uh, was uh, the chronic study, which was done by Ernst Kasperi. And so Kasperi took that same dose that was given all in a, in a couple of minutes or so, several seconds to the fruit flies. And he took that dose and he spread it out over the, the entire life of the, of the fruit flies. And, and what happened is that, you know, if you, if you believe in the piggy bank theory, the damage should be the same. It just adds up like a piggy bank. Add up to what it, when they gave it all at once. Well, as it turns out, Ernst Kasperi, he's, uh, you know, PhD in, in entomology, that sort of thing. Uh, they're all competent people. He does his study. He goes in and he finds no damage. He finds no damage. It's not a little damage. He didn't find any, he didn't find any, any significant treatment effect with this. And so he goes in and he tells Kurt Stern that, sorry, Kurt, but uh, this doesn't support the LNT. I find no damage. It supports a threshold. Well, what do you, what would you think that his advisor, his boss, Kurt Stern, would have said? He might have said, this is, this is great. You're challenging a basic hypothesis. It wasn't what he said. He said, I don't accept your findings. And he said, I don't accept your findings. Why? Because I'll tell you why. Because I believe that your control group was reading aberrantly high and therefore was biasing the data to show a threshold. So, sorry, the last two years of work haven't been very, uh, they're just a waste of time because it's all going downhill fast. And so, so but I give Kasperi some credit. Uh, Kasperi goes in and he goes into the literature and he finds a series of papers using the same model and takes a look at what their background mutation rate was. And guess what he finds that his mutation rate is right in the middle of those. It wasn't reading aberrantly high. So Kasperi goes back in, and I have this all in letters between Kasperi and, and Stern. So I have this, this record and I have, have these published and cited and documented. And so as it turns out, Kasperi shows this to Stern, and I'm going to give Stern great credit, Stern back down. He said, "Well, I can't. I can't reject your 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 uh, your control group." So I I'm concluding this means that he's going to reject LNT and accept the, the threshold because that's where the data would lead him. But guess what? That's not what he did. What he did. This is Stern, probably twisting uh, Kasperi's arm uh, because he was the boss. They decided to create a discussion in the paper they were going to write that discounts the Kasperi findings. Now, I have to tell you, again, um, nobody picks up on this. I come in 60 or so years later, I read the discussion, and I can't believe what I've read. The discussion in it, they suppress the significance of the threshold findings by demanding in the discussion of their paper that the data not be accepted until it could be determined why the response of Kasperi was not linear why it disagreed with the Spencer findings. Um, and they, they published this paper also in the, in the uh, Journal of Genetics really at the, at the same time. And so what actually happened, if you really look at this thing, they're trying to figure out, you can accept the Spencer data with all its flaws that showed linearity with the acute study, which really wasn't particularly relevant. But this other study that challenged it, which was a far better study and did not have all these methodological problems, you can't accept it until we can figure out why it differed from that earlier one. Accept the lousy study. Don't accept the good study until we can figure out why. But there were so many methodological differences between the acute study and the chronic study that they could never actually really resolve what those differences were. And it was a, it was just a, a straw man argument, but it was a way for, for, for Stern to keep the LNT theory alive. This was very significant. Now, I knew that Kasperi's data supported a threshold, okay? I, and I knew that Muller had gone to the Nobel, was going to get the Nobel Prize in, in uh, the fall of 46. And he, was, and he spoke, uh, and he got it on, February, on December 12th. He gave his talk, December 12th, 1946. And I'm saying, well, um, what did Muller say at his Nobel Prize? Did he... 
did did he acknowledge Kasperi? Because he was a consultant to this research. Did they? In my, but I knew from reading his Nobel Prize speech that he didn't acknowledge it. The only thing he acknowledged was that uh, was that research that I just discredited that was done at Edinburgh that supported the LNT. And so I'm saying, well, did Mueller know that Kasperi's work supported a threshold? Did they send it to him? He was a paid consultant to to the Manhattan Project and Stern and so forth up in Rochester. But did they send him the data? Well, I found for sure in letters between Mueller and Stern and so forth that on November 6th, 1946, um, they sent the Kasperi paper and the data set to Mueller, showing the support for a threshold. And Mueller wrote back to them on, on November 12th, 1946, in which he... Um, um, he states, he, he acknowledges, I see the data, the data challenged the uh, uh, the interpretation of an LNT. And, um, but it has, uh, and so when, just picture yourself, you are Mueller, you're going to get the Nobel Prize, you're going to give your talk on November, on December 12th, 1946, and you have just seen the best study to date that, that actually uh, does not support an LNT supports a threshold. It's the biggest and best study to date. And so you go to the Nobel Prize and, and you have the courage of the chutzpah or whatever you want to call it to stand up in front of the Nobel Prize Committee and say, we can no longer support uh, a threshold model. We have to reject it. We have to go and do uh, and, and turn over to a linear dose response model, knowing full well that he has just seen the best study to date, and it supports the opposite, supports the opposite. And in fact, in letters to Stern, he's saying, oh, this is a real serious problem. We need to come up with more money to try to, uh, you know, um, challenge the uh, the Kasperi findings. He doesn't share that with the Nobel Prize audience. He gives them a false message. And it was really, this is when I believe the scientific community truly starts to go downhill. It goes downhill with the decision of Stern to, to alter that the discussion and say, well, you can't accept this study until we find out why it disagrees. Very, very odd. And then Mueller goes in and Mueller uh, ignores the data that he has seen. And now what happens though, is that Mueller gets great publicity and he influences regulators, the media, the scientific community on the concerns with ionizing radiation, even at very low doses. Mueller begins to create his following. He has He's a Nobel Prize winner. And so, as I've just gone over here, prior to the Nobel Prize, Mueller knew of the threshold supporting data, that November 12th letter. Uh, Mueller recognized in his letter back to Stewart on the 12th that it strongly challenged LNT and urged uh, replication, which is what a scientist should actually say. Mueller, on uh, five weeks after his Nobel Prize speech, he actually sends a very detailed letter about the Kasperi paper uh, research to Stern, which I have, and he offers no technical criticism, none. And and uh, he just wants this uh, study to be replicated. So they actually get... Um, uh, when you take a look at the paper that was actually done and, and, and published, following the internal review by Mueller and Kasperi and Stern, the threshold conclusion was dropped. Um, and Mueller's name was added to the acknowledgments, the only real major changes in this paper. Now, they did try to replicate it, okay? Now, this becomes even more interesting because replication studies were conducted by Delta Apoc, whose picture I showed to you, uh, Warren Spencer had gone back to being a university professor, and then the same thing for Kasperi with the Middlebury uh, College down in Connecticut. And, and they were left with a new master's student, graduate student at Rochester by the name of Delta Uphoff. And Delta was going to try to replicate it all in her, in, in her research, right? It was going to be directed by, by Stern. Well, as it turns out, her first go at this stuff proved to be a real problem. Because, surprise, surprise, she had extremely low control group values, 40% below what was the average in the field and 40% below Kasperi. And in their write-up, a six-page write-up to the funding agency, 
they actually said that the data were uninterpretable because of the low control group. And they raised the question that it might have been uh, due to investigator bias. They weren't, they didn't think that that was the case, but nobody knew whether it was due to a bias, whether it was due to inexperience, whether it was due to background variability. Um, whatever it was, it was uninterpretable and they couldn't, and they decided that they couldn't use it. And this happened on, they, had, they ran three big experiments. This happened on one of the other two um, uh, occasions as well. And, and it's very odd when you write to your funder, which they did, and they told the funder that their findings were not usable, they were uninterpretable, and they even suggested to the funding agency that there was investigator bias. I mean, that's something you might not want to share with the funding agency. You might want to kind of figure out if it's true, and if it's true, correct it. And I mean, it's like, you know, truly hanging out your dirty laundry without actually casting uh, what the cause of this was. But it it told me that that Stern was aware that he probably had created an aura of uh, support for the LNT and wanted LNT supported. Why would somebody bring this up? And so Stern, as I said, blame this on, on various factors here. But um, as it turns out, that they did three studies uh, with APOF. Two studies had, had very low controls and were uninterpretable. The third study did not have a low control, but the responses were extremely high. In fact, about three and four fold higher than what would have been the case if it was truly an LNT response. In other words, there were so many irregularities in these three experiments by Delta APOF that the findings actually probably couldn't be used at all. And so at the end, was nothing going to come out of the out of this Manhattan Project? But no, something did come out. Stern pulled of the rabbit out of the hat. And what he did was he he decided not to share with the scientific community how he had disowned the uh, the low control group studies. He basically decided that they were now interpretable. The two studies that were uninterpretable were now interpretable, and and we'll dump out the the Casperi study, even though that had been uh, based on the control group, even though that had been uh, uh, that position had been discredited, and so and so he published a paper in the journal of Science in which he now had the um, the Spencer study and the three um, Delta Apoc papers, and when you line them all up. It appeared like a linear dose response relationship, and the entire relationship was fraudulent. And he claimed, and Delta, they claimed that they would, that this is a one page report, had no methods, no materials, no analysis, just a one large table. And they said that they were going to publish a very detailed, methodologically oriented paper with all what a scientific paper is supposed to have subsequently in another journal. And they never did. This is all they published, but it was in the Journal of Science, and therefore it has to be believed because it's in the Journal of Science. And it was it couldn't have been peer-reviewed. There really wasn't any data. Like with Mullis, it couldn't have been peer-reviewed. There was nothing to really peer-review, and Mullis doesn't, uh, doesn't produce mutations. And this paper uh, has, has so many flaws to it, and in fact... Um, uh, Rumors were, were were scattered by, I don't know where they would come from, but I could see them in the literature that um, even though it was um, it was uh, really discounted that uh, his control group was aberrantly high, people had rumors to that effect. And I have to tell you that I have many letters between Mueller and Stern in which Mueller privately with Stern, Mueller concluded that Kasperi's controls matched very closely with his and Deltas did not. So Herman Muller, in private letters to Stern, supported the Kasperi control group. Later, Muller would, without people knowing that he wrote these letters, would attack the Kasperi control group and contradict himself. Again, I'm the only one who picks this stuff up. The um, So the Kasperi controls, just going over this, Stern claimed that they they were aberrantly high. However, the literature supported uh, this, and there were unpublished data by Mueller. The basis of these conclusions are found in letters and cables and manuscripts 
by Stern and Muller. In the early 1950s, Muller repeatedly and inexplicitly challenged the Kasperi findings. This is hard to believe. This is a Nobel Prize winner, right? Claiming and writing that Kasperi's control group values were aberrantly high. Yet I personally have letters and everything else from Muller, um, both before and after the Kasperi paper, that fully support the Kasperi interpretation. He's, he's just dishonest. The only people that knew he was dishonest were Kasperi, Stern, maybe Upoff. Um, I'm not sure who else would have. And they were all afraid to say anything. I mean, this is how I'm looking at it. So what would make Mueller knowingly um, do this sort of thing? Well, there was a paper by this really great MIT professor who was a radiate health physicist named Robley Evans. And in 1949, he published a significant paper in science supporting the Kasperi work. And Muller was so upset, he writes to Stern saying, you gotta, you got to change what Robley Evans sa says. Muller has to rally the troops of the radiation geneticists so that they won't go down the Robley Evans uh, pathway. Uh, and so I think that the response to Robley Evans was Muller then writing three or four papers in the journal, lying, altering the interpretation of the record, and claiming that Kasperi's record... Uh, his his um, his control groups are aberrantly high, and the deltas were normal, and it's totally contradicted by by his letters and by and by the literature, and nobody stepped in to challenge this. So essentially, what happens, and it gets worse for them. So two key Apoff chronic experiments. I said these these da the data for the last two studies, and these are the chronic studies with Apoff. These data have never been published. And the data have been missing for 70 years. If you try to go back in and you try to find where is the data up off that, the, the Delta up off and Stern data for their chronic studies, where is it published? Where is it stored? Where is it located? Where is anything? It's, I haven't been able to find it. I have gone to the AEC records, to the UCAL Berkeley records, to the uh, Rochester records. I've gone to the American um philosophical association where kurt stern's papers are i've tried i've looked under every single rock that i know to, to turn over and i can't find where these data are he was supposed to publish these papers this paper in uh, subsequent uh, issues and then never did it's it's not there we are asked to to accept a one page i think in many ways uh um very problematic papers um, as the basis of of cancer risk assessment, when the Bayer Committee, which we'll talk about, came forth, no information exists on on the two chronic studies of uh, of these people beyond a one page summary. And based on the study design information, now it's been recently shown that the Delta Uphoff studies actually contain two simultaneous variables. So it's so interesting. And it could not test the total dose versus dose rate hypothesis. Um, and so the study was actually fundamentally flawed, even if the data are found today. It can't answer the question. And, and these methodological flaws have recently been, been summarized. But what it is, is that they, they had uh, uh, differences in dose, which is the, which was uh, the variable you're looking. And then they, then they altered the uh the, the timing and arrangement for the exposure to the radiation um such as to introduce a second variable and that you really couldn't do this but they did and i have to say i missed this many times over but within the last 18 months i de detected it got it published and went through peer review to make this happen so what it really does is it shows that the up papers you really can't use and they have been used to establish uh, cancer risk assessment by the National Academy committees. So what happens now? Stern publishes a highly acclaimed genetics book with multiple editions in 1950, uh, supporting uh, the Uphoff and Spencer work and ignoring the Kasperi findings. In 1956, there is a creation of this uh, National Academy of Sciences committee in light of uh, major problems tied in with fallout, and trying to and the, the new world with atomic energy and trying to come up with with a um, uh, with a new way to look at uh, at the risks associated with uh, with radiation. Now this is, becomes very interesting here, and that is that 
the committee was um, a National Academy Committee on the Biological Effects of Atomic Radiation. That's what Bayer stands for. And it was created at the request of the Rockefeller Foundation. They wrote a letter to President Eisenhower and said that there was a national need to get our national hands around this problem, which is probably true, and that they would fund it and that they would give the money to the National Academy. And now one thing that I don't know if Eisenhower knew this, but the Rockefeller uh, organization, they had the Rockefeller Foundation and the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Sciences, which will become the Rockefeller University. Now, the president of the Rockefeller um, Institute for Medical Research and a member of the Rockefeller Foundation was also the same person who just happened to be the president of the National Academy of Sciences. Same was Detlef Bronk. So the Rockefeller organization controlled uh, <laughs> controlled the direction of the National Academy of Sciences, right? They had the president of the Rockefeller you know, Institute for Medical Research, and they're going to be giving him money to direct a study um, on, on, on radiation, okay? And so, as it turns out, um, nobody objects to this, right? And so now, one of the most significant things happens here. Now, in the United States, up until this time, when you're looking at medical-related issues, you have a medical panel, and that's been common. But what that Leaf Bronk did was very, very unusual. He kept the medical panel, but he created a, a new and unique and totally, for the very first time, a genetics panel. And... Now there were four, there were six panels all told. That the, the two medical ones were genetics and, and medicine. All the the five others were, were chaired by technical people, the way you might expect National Academy panels to be constructed. The genetics panel was not chaired by a a geneticist. It was chaired by the director of research at what? The Rockefeller Foundation, Warren Weaver, whose picture you showed, I showed earlier. Now Warren Weaver had been funding the geneticist uh, in this country, the leading geneticist for the last 25 to 30 years. He was funding Mueller. He was funding uh, the Caltech operation with George Beadle and and uh, others, uh, Edward Lewis, uh, Sturdivant, other people who would ultimately make up this, and, and others, actually. And so he knew these people. He knew them well by name, by personality. He knew their views. He knew their views on LNT. And so what actually happened was when they chose the committee to make uh, the genetics panel, he chose 13 geneticists, most of whom he had funded, the views of all he knew, and they all strongly supported what? In their writings, the LNT model. So what he did was, uh, even though th there could have been great debate over LNT and threshold, and perhaps maybe another model or so, but... They, they they stacked the deck, stacked the jury, and they chose people who believed only a certain way. Now, that's a uh, that's not the way to uh, to actually do this. <laughs> if if you want if you want the if you want the outcome to come out the way you want it to, that's what you do. You stack the deck. Now, I I was naive when I was getting into this, and I and I wanted to see just how these these great genetic thinkers actually debated the issue of dose response. Now, what were the arguments that were so persuasive that made them go to, to LNT? Well, as it turns out, they had no debate, none, zero debates. What they did was one of our uh, Muller's uh, close friend and colleague at, at Indiana, Tracy Sornerborn, he wrote the Apostles' Creed for the, the uh, radiation geneticists group on this Bear One committee. And actually, it was all about what it was all all mutations uh, all damage is is uh, is harmful all damage is cumulative damage is not repaired damage is irreversible you add those four things together and guess what you get you get a linear dose response relationship and that's actually what they read into the uh, the uh, transcripts of the uh, bear one committee early on in their deliberations and so uh and so basically what happened here is that, is that uh, the, this committee then adopted LNT uh, and they rejected a threshold model. They had also failed to assess the scientific basis for LNT, but they, they adopted it on the basis 
of an assumption that it was true. It was a belief. It was actually a belief. They didn't fight about it. And now, the the interesting thing was that um, during this process, uh, they also provided no documentation, and they were challenged by by people outside the, the, the you know in, in the academic community to provide a basis for their their conclusion. And the president of the National Academy, Dat Leifbrong from the Rockefeller Foundation, he he sided with the committee and said, you don't have to provide documentation. Now, what scientific organization doesn't have to provide documentation? I mean, seriously, right? I mean, you're defending a dissertation, and I'm going to give you a conclusion? Give me a break, right? There's nobody that can get away with that, right, in the scientific community. But guess who got away with it? The Bear One Committee. And guess who that Bear One Committee was supported by? The president of what? The National Academy of Sciences. These are the people that we look to for national leadership, right? Nobody questions them, however. Did anybody ever, you ever hear of this being questioned before? No, not at all. Okay, but, it, but you, if you think the story's bad, it actually gets worse. Because why? Well, just when the committee's being put together, right? It's, it's really November of 1955. And that's about 10 years after the dropping of the atomic bomb over in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? Well, in 1946, the United States and the Japanese government, under the auspices of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, surprisingly, puts together a big study on the effects of the atomic bomb on the survivors and their offspring from Japan. And in charge of the genetic study was none other than a panel member by the name of Jim Neal, who's a professor of medicine at the University of Michigan. So Neil works on this for 10 years, studies 75,000 people, has a gigantic staff. And now I'm not a geneticist and I've, uh, I'm kind of concluding if I, if I didn't know what I, what I know today, that there should have been all kinds of genetic uh, damage to the offspring of the survivors of the atomic bomb uh, explosions, right? But Neil studies these and they study them in as much depth as they can possibly study them. And after 10 years, with 75,000 people, they conclude that there is no statistically significant increase in the occurrence of mutation, birth effects, and whatever other endpoints that they were looking at. None. That is shocking to me. But that is what the data showed. So what happens is that Jim Neal sends that report to Mueller ahead of set sharing that with the committee and he shows up and he gives it to the committee and he asked them to to that, that this should be uh, considered by the committee it's it's why the committee was created to evaluate the health effects of, of ionizing radiation and low dose of ionizing radiation on human populations muller stands up in front of the group and tells them that these non-significant findings are illusionary quote-unquote illusionary and that they should not be giving standing to this this study. And I'd have to tell you that this Bayer Committee chose not to evaluate the 10-year study that was done by the National Academy, the U.S. government, and the Japanese government, led by their own committee member, Jim Neal. Now, just what would you think if you were Jim Neal? This is like, I mean, 10 years, that's, that's like double... Double what a dissertation is, right? I mean, that's 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 a long time to work on a study with all these people working under you, doing the best job you can. And then you have this committee, and the committee gives no standing to your work. And this is the this is the object of your committee. Now, Neil actually gives his report to a to a parallel British committee, and they and they look at it and they think that this is actually an excellent study. And they use it to impact their thinking on low-dose radiation. But does the U.S. do that? No. Guess what the U.S. did? The U.S. said, no, we'll revert back to using the Delta Uphoff studies. And we'll base our work on Drosophila instead of the human studies. This is, this is actually what our regulations were based on. Now, if you think that that's bad, it actually gets worse. It's, now, it's hard to imagine that this story 
the story of our cancer risk assessment could get much worse. But as it turns out, it does. And this is what happens here. And that is that uh, once the panel decided to go LNT, to go linear, there was really very little for them to do because they had made the decision. They, they had you know, no great debate over, well, was it a threshold? Was it linear? Was it something else? What was the data behind it? That could have taken six weeks, six meetings right there to just argue about this. But they decided right away that there was nothing to debate. They didn't even have to provide a justification for it. It was linear all the way. And plus, they weren't going to look at this this 75,000 person study that was coming out of the Jim Neal and, and the uh, Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission from Japan. So guess what? All committees and organizations are somewhat bureaucratic, and they had enough money for five or six or so meetings. So Warren Weaver decided, well, since they had already decided that they were going to go linear, he was going to give these very brainy people some, some make work to do. So he, he forced them all to try to estimate the number of uh, mutations, birth effects that would take place in the U.S. population at that point, 160 million, um, uh, if they were exposed to 10 rads of radiation in one generation, over 10 generations, and um, some different permutations, and and he gave them a month to figure it out. And and the the statement was that even though they're all different kinds of geneticists, he wanted them to use their own methodologies, but they had to assume a linear dose response relationship, and to get the results into him within a month for the next meeting they would have. Well, as it turns out, three of the uh, three of the 12 members on the committee, one member dropped out because he had academic uh, work and couldn't continue, but they had 12 geneticists on this committee then. Nine decided that they were not going, uh, three decided they were not going to do this because it was just uh, impossible to do. The data were too uh, uncertain and it, it just wouldn't yield anything meaningful. But nine decided to do the report. And so they all turned these reports in within within two uh, two to four months, two to four weeks. So I have copies in this office right behind me of all nine. And so, and as it turns out, uh, they were sent to this person, James Crow, to collate, collate and put all the material together, not to make any judgments, but to make charts and so forth and to make sure everybody saw what everybody else thought. Well, as it turns out, the first thing that the Crow sees is that, my God, everybody differs from each other. They, even though we're forced to believe in, uh, and use LNT, the results that came out were scattered. There was so much uncertainty. There was so much inter, you might say, radiation geneticist variability. He writes to Weaver and says, oh God, this is a terrible assignment because nobody agrees with each other. It's all over the place. If the public sees how much we disagree amongst ourselves, they will never, ever uh, accept any recommendations that we offer. They'll just see that it's like, like we're chasing our tail. It doesn't work. And so what happened is that on his own, I believe this was on his own, but I do believe it was influenced by Mueller and I have reasons for this, that he actually on his own, James Crow, removes the three most deviant estimates. They happen to be the two from the human radiation group and, and one from uh, bacterial geneticists. They were left with Drosophila and mouse genetics. And, and they were left with six estimates. Now, what that did was it lowered the amount of variability uh, from in the many thousands down to 750 fold. They must have determined that that was even too much variability. And then without providing any documentation, they then made a, a de facto statement that the group disagreed by the, the group thought that the variability in the human population was um, uh, was 100 fold. And so that was kind of uh, what they felt probably they could live with and think was credible enough. But the reality was far greater than that. And they hit it. And so it, I discovered this kind of inadvertently. I know that nine people had provided these estimates. So I'm reading the National Academy report that they published in the journal Science. And in that, they, they, the committee writes, they said, and, and we challenged the committee to make uh, estimates of the amount of, of um, mutations or birth effects in the next generation um, if exposed to so much radiation. And of the 12 geneticists, six took up the challenge. 
Well, I knew. Then there were nine who took up the challenge. But the committee, in their science paper and in their report to the public, is actually saying that six took up the challenge. So I go back and I get all my nine out. And I'm saying, I have all nine. Nine took up the challenge. And they actually removed three to reduce the variability. So this panel, when they published their report in science, they altered the research record. And they actually lied to the public through the science paper that their uncertainty was only tenfold when it was many, many thousands fold. And, and, and this was, uh, again, hidden and masked. Nobody knew about this until, you know, I dig out, dug out those, uh, those details and it was hidden. And so, uh, and then what's happened now is that they, they actually had two reports, the science journal one and one report to the public that went to every library in the United States. And they were represented the public report as being written by the panel that reflected the panel's views. And about a year ago or less than that, I discovered that actually that the public report of 1956 by the Bayer Genetics Panel, guess what? It was not written by the panel. It was not even reviewed by the panel. It wasn't approved by the panel. It was written by an independent third party. And it was promoted as what? Written by the panel and reviewed by the panel, approved by the panel. It was a lie by the National Academy of Sciences again. So, so the National Academy of Sciences leadership nonetheless asserted that this report was approved and written by the panel. So who can, and that was Detlef Bronk again. The panelists asserted that the, uh, this is, and I got the, the <laughs> letters, multiple letters by panel members asserting that the, this report that was, that it was claimed that they authored, that they know they didn't, contained serious errors and the errors were never acknowledged or corrected. The panel members knew of this, of these actions, and they never acted to correct the matter. So even though Deadly Bronk may have been unethical, the panel members, they weren't so uh, pure either. Because now why didn't they speak up and challenge that report that actually had errors in it and didn't represent their views? Why? Because they were all getting funded by whom? The Rockefeller Foundation. And guess who was president of the National Academy? But Deadly Bronk was president of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research and on the Rockefeller Funding Board. So they kept their mouths shut. Why? Because I think it might have been in their self-interest too. So we look at this here, and there was a lot of significance that came out of that bear report. There's the International Commission for Radiation Protection. They immediately lowered their ex occupational exposure standards by two-thirds. They don't even know what's going on in their responding to this recommendation. Lower it by two-thirds. The Federal Radiation Council and the Atomic Energy Commission established nuclear power plant emissions totally based on the rec on the risk estimates of the uh, of the panel. These standards were then used by Goffman and Tamplin to estimate cancer risks, creating massive controversy, leading to the establishment of Beer One in 1970. This Beer One report had a lot of significance immediately, ultimately even affecting the U.S. EPA. And then it led Eisenhower also, it was so controversial because it was challenging the AEC's leadership on, on risk. And the AEC was much more in tune towards a threshold interpretation. And so it led Eisenhower to remove risk assessment from the AEC and create a whole new federal agency, our group called the Federal Radiation Council, the FRC. It directly led then to Ed Lewis in his influential paper on leukemia and, and radiation risk assessment. So this bare one had significance. This LNT recommendation was soon applied to somatic cells for cancer risk assessment by the National Committee for Radiation Protection and Management in 1958, incorrectly assuming that the findings with mature spermatozoa could be generalized to all cells. The panel members testified before Congress strongly emphasizing the Spencer and Uphoff findings supported their linearity recommendation, flawed studies supporting it. Nobody challenges these people because they're, they're the dream team. They are the actual dream team. And that's how they were characterized by the leading media. And the dream team was full of people who actually created scientific misconduct. So I recommend recommendations of the Beer Committee 
provided the foundation for cancer risk assessment for chemicals and radiation worldwide. It's the most significant action in the history of environmental risk assessment. The Bayer One Genetics Committee recommendation was the result of an orchestrated deception by key leaders of the radiation genetics community, Kurt Stern, Herman Muller, and eventually the entire genetics panel and the leadership of the Rockefeller Foundation. They all signed off on it. They all signed off on it. They all committed scientific misconduct. In, in my world, if you falsify the research record, you lose your job. You don't get Nobel Prize named after you. You don't get lectures named after you. But they did. And they still have those honors associated with their names. Um, the, the principal goal of these individuals was to support LNT and to advocate its use and risk assessment. So Ed B, Edward B. Lewis and leukemia in LNT, how does one paper and one person make a difference? Well, who was Ed B. Lewis? He's a future Nobel Prize laureate in 1995, and by 1957, when he wrote his big paper, he was a young Caltech genetics professor, a, flu a fruit fly expert, he had no education in radiation, cancer biology, leukemia, epidemiology, risk assessment, biostatistical modeling at low doses, yet he writes this paper in science on this very topic. So how does he get involved in this? So he's, uh, he gets inspired. So Cal Caltech was the center of a lot of environmental activism, most notably Linus Pauling, who was the head of chemistry and chem engineering, and Alfred Sturdivant and George Beadle, they were in the biology area. Beadle challenged all his faculty in his department to try to assess the impact that followed on humans in July of 55, before actually the panel was being put together. The only one out of about 24 who took up the challenge was Edward Lewis. And this started his efforts that would lead to this 1957 science paper. Now, I'm going to raise the question, did Lewis become a stalking horse, a scientific stalking horse for the National Academy Bear One Genetics Panel? A 10-year report on genetics damage in the offspring of atomic bombs is negative. We just mentioned that. Reported early 1956 by Jim Neal. This report was rejected by the panel because it didn't support their paradigm, so Neil gives it to the British where it was influential. Now, what happens is that major dispute happens between Muller and Neil that we talked about, but uh, and you just picture Neil here, right? Neil, Neil's all his work, Muller wouldn't let him present it. The whole recommendation goes out to the world without having any impact from the atomic bomb work of Neil. Just picture this, right? Just picture how crazy this situation is. So Neil is going to go to Stockholm to a WHO conference and meetings uh, in August of 1956. And, and he is at this meeting. And, and what happens is that Muller tries to prevent Neil from publishing his findings in a major WHO document. He doesn't want it to get out. This caused major problems in the genetics field, Many people are taking either sides, and and, and I've written about this, and, and it's a, a really juicy story to go into the details. But at the same time, Bear One is going to continue, and Weaver has left to go back to to uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, actually, to try to get grant money for, for the radiation genetics researchers. But Beetle, the chair of the panel, he had to redirect the panel from this study to the leukemia issue because because uh, they were just arguing like crazy over mutation and risk, and, and he tried to re-motivate this guy, Lewis. Well, as it turns out, he does motivate Lewis, and Lewis, uh, uh, Beetle gets Lewis to share his draft science paper with the panel in late November, and he gets their comments. Well, as it turns out, uh, he revises the manuscript, uh, he, he and uh, re removing comments that he was unable to prove his low-dose LNT leukemia assessment, actually. He ties his mutation mechanism to research in fruit fly and mature sper spermatozoa that were not relevant to somatic cells. Later, his work was determined to, um, that's Muller's work, was uh, determined to produce major gene deletions and not gene mutations. And then the on the, the science panel was Bailey and Bentley Glass, who was one of six senior editors at Science. So they Lewis had a had a contact at Science, a senior editor, 
Uh, he gets his paper published in Science, and, and it comes out in, in May 17th of 57, strongly advocating LNT for radiation-induced leukemia. Received, this is really significant too, he receives a strong supportive editorial endorsement, despite the fact that the editor-in-chief knew little at best about the technical aspects of his paper. Lewis gets right away appointed to the NCRPM, this National Committee for Radiation Protection, and, and it recommends going LNT for cancer. Now, the interesting thing here is that the paper received great publicity and momentum. He gets The paper gets discussed on Meet the Press one week later. Lewis testifies in Congress a week after that, essentially June 3rd, 57, supporting LNT. Then Life Magazine a week after that, big story on radiation and plastered Lewis's picture all throughout. I mean, Lewis became a superstar within a month. The impact of Lewis's paper was significant. It established the LNT concepts for cancer risk assessment, provided the biostatistical basis for cancer risk assessment, and applied LNT to leukemia. Now, as it turns out, uh, this approach was then generalized for all types of tumors and applied to uh, ionizing radiation and to chemical carcinogens. And the impact continued through Beer 1, 1972, with Lewis becoming very influential in the activities of those committees. Now, well, I want to just share briefly some of the problems with the Lewis, the Lewis paper. Lewis failed to analyze the Hiroshima and Nagasaki data properly, and I'll show you why. Other radiation groups exposed, other radiation exposed leukemia population groups had very, very high doses. This is an example of the leukemia that was shown in the uh, Nagasaki Hiroshima data. Now, I'm showing you. <clears throat> along the bottom here, a radiation dose from the hypo center or where the bomb actually uh, was exploded. And, and what you have is that the, the, uh, the closest to where the bomb was was number four. And the furthest away is number one. And the risks go up um, from 100% up to 300% and higher. The dash line represents what the control group would have had. At the high, and, and these little studies that are designated on the right from 1955 all the way to 1964. They represent a series of studies by the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission. Um, every single study complete listing. As it turns out, you can see that at high doses, the risks are very high. But as you get down to low, further away from the hypo center, you notice that all these, that every one of these studies shows that the risk actually of leukemia goes below what the control group has. It's a J-shaped dose response. It's a consistent J-shaped dose response. Yet when Lewis published his papers, he didn't publish a J-shaped response. He published a linear response. So how do I get a J-shaped response? And Lewis gets a linear dose response. Well, I can tell you exactly how Lewis got his linear dose response. He took the doses that were in number one and he combined them with the responses that were in number two. And so it actually made, it actually eliminated the dose that was below the control group and it modulated the, the response between one and two so that if you then, uh, then plot it, it comes out to a linear dose response. It's very, very interesting what he did. And, and I would have to say that this, this J-shaped dose response was actually reported by researchers from UNESCO in 1958 in the scientific literature. It was discussed and debated by the Bayer Genetics Committee, who also reported a J-shaped dose response, but then they were afraid to report it because it, it, it was inconsistent with the, uh, with the political paradigm. And so they went with, with it. But I found in their, dis in their discussion and debate and so forth, but all the data shows this relationship. It's a very interesting one. Now, but the other... The other, um, so Lewis ignores the conclusions of study authors that their findings would not provide. Oh, this is interesting. The, they, they looked at three other groups, and the groups were looking at, at people who had um, um, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, which is a terrible arthritic type condition of the spine, and they were treated with high doses of radiation. Kids who had a large thymus at the time were treated with with radiation to, to shrink the thymus. They don't do that anymore. And then there were radiologists who had higher exposure than other physicians to, to uh, do x-rays. And he found that all these groups had 
uh, high risks of um, leukemia, and he uh, used his methodological approaches to estimate their cancer risk and determined that they all converged and supported LNT. Well, if you go back into the original literature for each of these groups, starting with the ankylosing spondylitis, let's go with the with the uh, um, with the uh, the children study with the enlarged thymus. The investigators specifically said you cannot use our studies for a low dose cancer risk assessment. And and what happens is that is that Ed Lewis actually does use it, and that's okay by me if he would actually explain to the public why he disagreed with the experts in those in those views. But he hides it from from the experts. And actually, the in the case of the children with the with the uh, thymus, they didn't actually show any any leukemia at all. And he hid that as well. Now, when it comes to the to the physicians with the radiologist, he used very old data, data that were back in the 1910s and 20s, where the exposures were as high as 2,100 rads. It was anything but low dose radiation, and and he um, could have used more recent data and didn't. Uh, later studies discredited his findings. The entire uh, report of Lewis was actually pretty much a scientific uh, an abomination. And so uh, Lewis's use of mutation data was shown to be incorrect. He made multiple unverified unverif exposure assumptions that lack scientific grounding, being best characterized as just guesses. He failed to consider the capacity of multiple other factors that could affect disease, uh, incidents lacking a broader epidemiologic perspective, multiple limitations in research transparency failures integrate just a terribly high degree of bias by Lewis. Lewis was strongly, his paper was strongly criticized by numerous high-level scientists. Um, Lewis did not even rebut these criticisms, and no member of the radiation genetics community or member of the Bayer panel came to Lewis's defense. Very, very interesting. He got members of the, uh, the, the NCRPM to adopt his precautionary principle for cancer risk assessment. The compromise was that Lewis that Lewis made was to admit that his data were not adequate for him to support LNT at low doses. Now this uh, and uh, this type of resolution for the low dose cancer risk was later adopted by regulatory agencies. And, you know he raises a risk; he can't prove it. You can't prove yours. I can't prove mine. We'll adopt a precautionary principle, and that's really what EPA has come to. And and again, during the same time period in 1958. Bill Russell actually reports a major finding, and that is that he finds that this dose, total dose versus dose rate, he decides that it actually, it's all about dose rate. He found that in mice, that in the uh, in, in female and male reproductive cells, the spermatogonia and oocyte, that in fact, DNA or genetic repair takes place, and that uh, at low doses, essentially, you can repair damage almost as fast as it's being as being generated. And, and in fact, he shows that at low doses, of not that low, at a dose that was 27 to 30,000 times greater than background in the female, then in fact, uh, that was a threshold. Um, and so he reported that in 1958. And, and as it turns out, this was... Uh, at low dose rates, the X-ray and gamma rays induced mutation was significantly decreased compared to the same total dose when given acutely. Really shot down this, this piggy bank theory of Muller. These findings suggested the existence of DNA repair and the possibility of a threshold. And as I mentioned, uh, research with the female revealed a threshold effect at low dose rates, 27,000 fold greater than background. Research with the male showed a very strong uh, repair but uh, where 70% of the damage was reduced, but it did not achieve a threshold in those reported studies. Now, and, and we'll talk about that in a second. During this same time period, this is a very bizarre situation. In 1959, 1960, Russell and Arthur Upton, who was the former director, will become the former director of the National Cancer Institute and the chairman of Bayer 5 in 1990, they suppressed a major negative lifespan and radiation cancer study with mice. It was a big study, was started in 1956, concluded around 50, the latter, part, latter part is 59. And, and what Russell did was he hid it. 
He would not publish it. He didn't share it with the Bayer Committee that he was on. He was a consultant to the Federal Radiation Council, the FRC, advising the government on radiation risks. He's working at Oak Ridge, which is part of the AEC. He's using government, he's using tax dollars for this. And guess what he does with the tax dollar research? He hides it from Congress. He hides it from his agency. He hides it from the committees. He just plain old hides it. He later in writing, Russell said that he hid it because it was feared that publication of negative finding could mislead the public into a false feeling of safety. Now, just think of this. You're a scientist, and what we are taught to do is follow the data. So what does he do? Does he follow the data? No, he hides the data. Now, but it's interesting. Did he hide it for his entire life? No, he didn't. 35 almost years later goes by, 1993, right? The modern era. And, and Art Upton is consulting for the British nuclear industry. And they are being sued over... Um, over uh, radiation exposures to workers and effect on the the offspring of those workers, a lot like this study that was being that that was conducted by Russell and Upton back in the late 1950s. But Upton knew that the study had been suppressed, and nobody knew about that except a few people. He calls up Bill Russell and says, "I'm consulting on this case over in the UK, and I want us to publish that data that we've su <laughs> we've suppressed for three and a half decades, right?" And let me fly out here and bring some of the consultants and lawyers from the UK. And they all arrive at Oak Ridge and they create the deal that they will now reactivate this hidden data. So why? So the British nuclear industry can win a court case. And so what happens is that, is that uh, the data, but the data have to now get published and they have to get published or presented or submitted before the, before the trial is actually fully underway. So they work like crazy, and they eventually get the paper submitted to the journal Mutation Research on the very day, the very day that Arthur Upton testifies over in the UK. And they get the paper accepted, it gets in, the paper helps and the testimony helps, and they win the case. They actually win the case. It remains unknown that this is all together. And a year and a half or so ago, I end up discovering that this happens. Uh, with conversations with Paul Selby, who was at Oak Ridge at the time. And we write a paper on how William Russell and Art Upton suppressed this. Now, you might not think this is significant, but this paper would have come out in 1960. It was a paper that showed that there was no impact on longevity. It was a paper that said there was no impact on the cancer risk, leukemia, and other types of cancers. And it was a very massive dose. It was there was a near fatal dose to the mice that were given this dose. Uh, and it was not shared with the scientific community. But the paper was good enough, good enough to be to pass peer review 35 years later at a very high ranked journal called Mutation Research. You would have thought that Mutation Research editorial staff would have had a little bit of interest in trying to figure out why the heck a paper was sat on for 35 years, and now it's being sent to that journal and exposing the story. But did they do it? No, they did not. That's an issue as well. Now, why didn't they do that? So this is the history that's unfolding. Russell never shared these findings with <clears throat> Bayer, AEC, FRC, Beer, others. He, he kept it to himself. Now, during the same period when everybody is worrying about low doses of radiation causing mutation, a researcher at UCAL Berkeley uh, by the name of uh, Harmon, Dr. Harmon, he comes up with this idea that it's what? It's, um, um, it's uh, oxy radicals uh, that are the cause of aging and that are the cause of uh, mutation and that they cause uh, all kinds of diseases. And, and eventually what happens is that he leaves Berkeley in 1956 and goes to the University of Nebraska. And by 1962, he publishes a paper that he claims this, is, this, is, this changes everything. He claims that exogenous metabolism produces 200 endogenous metabolism, like, you know, from just normal life, produces 200 million times more mutagen oxy radicals than background radiation per unit time, per cell. 
It's like I'm looking in the mirror, and what's my biggest enemy? Is it background radiation? No, it's my metabolism. It's me. My biggest enemy is who? It's me. Okay? DNA repair evolved to correct damage from endogenous metabolism, not background radiation. I mean, 200 million times different. These developments were not cited by the radiation genetics community from 1956 on, but they knew the guy. He was even part of their group. He was, he was close associates with John Goffman uh, at Berkeley at the time. Goffman told them of the job that was open at, uh, at Nebraska that he applied to. They had a relationship. Mutations from endogenous metabolism, according to Dr. Harmon, and now really more, more or less affirmed over the years, is the mechanism of evolution. It is not background radiation. Muller was wrong. Now, in 1992, the, um, the, this is a new committee, and this is, and this is very, very interesting, too. This, this 1956 committee went all the way to 1964, that Bear One committee, and it went out of business in 1964. There's a new national, uh, the new kid on the block in 1970 called the Beer Committee. They changed atomic to ionizing and called it BEIR instead of BEAR. So it's 1970 to 1972. Now, why does this new committee get created? Why? Because a great controversy caused by John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin, the Tamplin Goffman controversy of 1969 to whenever it ends. And it was all about the uh, emissions from uh, nuclear power plants. And, and these sta these the standards for emission were based on recommendations from, from Bayer 1. And so Goffman and Tamplin decided that they would uh, reinterpret uh, in, their, in light of their, their, their own LNT perspective now, now and apply it to just not mutation risk, but to leukemia and cancer risk, and came out with estimates of how many cancers per year uh, having nuclear power plants could theoretically cause throughout the United States and cause all kinds of confusion and all kinds of great debate, all kinds of bitter acrimony, and leading to all kinds of publicity throughout the media. And it led the United, uh, the lit Congress to go to the National Academy and say, we need another National Academy committee to resolve this Goffin and Tamplin thing. And that's actually what happened, why that was created in 1970, 19 to 1972. And this committee themselves, after their deliberations, the genetics committee, rejected the conclusion of the genetics panel that mutation rate was independent of dose rate. They accepted, they accepted the, the new findings of Russell. However, this panel that was chaired by Jim Crow, who was, uh, who was a, a very, very close to, to Herman Muller, they retained LNT because the spermatogonia responses had not regressed to the control values, as was the case, as I mentioned, with the oocytes. So in the modern era, what happens now is that this committee um, answered to the U.S. EPA that had incorporated, uh, when Nixon uh, reformulated environmental uh, organizations within the, within the U.S. government, he, he inserted the FRC, Federal Radiation Council, into EPA to be in charge of the radiation actual activities. They're all EPA employees as of well, when Nixon did that. And, and essentially what happened is that in 1975, the EPA made a decision to accept the recommendation for linearity based on beer one, and it adopted the uh, recommendation that came out of the William Russell's studies for the male, uh, the, the the male mouse, it was it was that the it wasn't fully protective, fully fully repairing of the damage, whereas the female seemed to be. And so now, what? But I'm going to fast forward this to you to 1996 because it gets even more interesting. As it turns out, Paul Selby, who was a, a graduate student of uh, of uh, Russell, and worked at at Oak Ridge from probably when he was a student until he retired. From 1966 or so on, in 1994, what happened is that um, the Russells, Bill had already retired and his wife Leanne was getting ready to retire. They were told they had to organize all their, their millions of mice studies into 
the new computer age, and that uh, and that uh, Paul Selby could do this and organize it and save their data for posterity and evaluations. And so Paul was at, did a favor for the Russells to go into their files and to try to check everything out. He had to do the same for his own because he had a long career there too. And to his surprise, when he was going through the Russell records, he finds, wow, there's a series of genetic cluster mutations in the control group in Russell's back in 1955 that was somehow never actually um, uh, recorded and reported by the Russells. And he said, well, why was this the case? That's There was a serious problem. And then he found, reminded him of some other time when there was a a, a, a mutation cluster in 1986 that Bill Russell well, was part of, and, and Paul was uh, was brought in to, to see, and it was also never reported. Then he read a couple of papers by Leanne Russell that was trying to interpret this, but never linked them back to these major studies that the Russells did. So Paul Selby then in, informs the upper-level management of the Department of Energy of these research anomalies. The Department of Energy then tells him to sneak back into the lab and to try to find more anomalies. So he does, and he finds a series of massive gene, massive uh, gene cluster mutations that are not reported by the Russells. And 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 so what happens is that, as you can imagine, um, it, it's just a meltdown that takes place. The Department of Energy decides to have a big, big showdown with the Russells and Selby. They bring in four outside outside people to have this showdown, and it happens in in uh, 1995. And so, as it turns out, now Bill uh, Paul Selby believes that in fact the Russells uh, that the Russells are actually uh, self serving, and why they didn't put these. Uh, why they hid their, these mutations. They, he believes, and I believe this is true, that they hid their mutations because uh, but what it, what they did was they hid the mutations in the control group, and they made the, their control group appear more sensitive than, than Drosophila by 15-fold. They showed that there was support for LNT, and it put them into a major position of professional growth, and they grew their their operation in in Oak Ridge enormously. Big, big mouse house was built, hundreds of employees, and the Russells were were king and queen of Oak Ridge. And 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 it was, but if they had shown the mutations in their control groups, it would have greatly diminished the significance of what was what was present. And 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 this was this was very interesting. And so what happened, the bottom line in all this was that the committee did not want to get into well, uh, were the Russells unethical or not unethical? They just said the Russells were wrong. They should have included the data. And Selby was right. So he told the Russells that they needed to correct the scientific record. And they told Selby to do his version as well. So they both published, both groups published papers. And just for the sake of this presentation, just go with the Russell correction. The Russell, the Russells acknowledged that they were off by 120% in their control group. Now picture this, you are a student and you make a mistake in your control group by 120%. I mean, seriously, right? But this is these are two people that are in charge of everybody and they make a mistake that has to be corrected by 120%. Well, when you make, uh, and so that was, they, were, they published that in the, in the literature between Selby and, and the Russells, all this came out in the late 1980s. Nobody did much with it. It just kind of stayed there. I come in 2016, 17, I read this, find out about the controversy. I say, well, if they had made the correction such, and they applied it back to 1972, what would it have done? Well, it actually would have resulted in the females showing a hormetic response and the males showing a, lin uh, showing a threshold response. It would have resulted in, wow, not support for the LNT based upon a study that ultimately is involving more than 5 million mice. I mean, this is, this is like, uh, which is mechanistically based. It would have changed the whole nature of the discussion. But did EPA, the National Academy, go back in and dig this out? Did they bring a committee to look at it? Did they try to? No, they never do anything. They just let it, they just let it get covered by dust. So we have now tried to put this whole thing in perspective for you because it's, it's quite a story. 
Key findings in perspective, Muller's evolution concept of a highly stable genome and no genetic damage is now proven to be incorrect. Muller's claim of genetic mutation, guess what? His Nobel Prize is proven to be incorrect. The single hit model based on Muller's incorrect assumptions is shown to be flawed. Muller was deliberately deceptive in his Nobel Prize lecture. Muller and Stern misrepresented the Manhattan Project to promote LNT. The NAS panels, let's take a look at them. The Bear One panel, 1956, well, we now know that it misrepresented the scientific record to promote acceptance of LNT, and their public report was not even written or approved by them and contained serious errors. I mean, that's a fact. The Bear One genetic subpanel, 1972, the Department of Energy Research, there are more than 2 million mice, actually more than 5 million mice, provided a new basis for LNT. Founded, there was a foundation for the EPA LNT right to the present time. A major error was discovered two decades later by Paul Selby. Correction shows a threshold or hormetic dose response should have been established. So why has LNT succeeded? Well, producing gene mutations was a major advance at the time. Evolution and mutation concepts overwhelmed the field and became integrated within LNT. Peer-reviewed studies, the one in Edinburgh, um, peer, key studies were not peer-reviewed. The, the one in Edinburgh by Ray Chahori was not. The EPOF was never published. The data are missing. And actually, the studies, those two studies are even uh, flawed in their design and, and aren't useful even, even in today if we could even find and rehabilitate the work. The Manhattan Project had massive uh, project influence. Dropping the A-bomb frightened the world. The Nobel Prize created a major platform for Mueller and his ideology. The Cold War with above-ground testing created even more fear. The Rockefeller Foundation, well, guess what they did? They created a separate genetics panel, and that changed everything. That gave them the stacked deck uh, to promote the LNT ideology. The NAS, with its appeal to authority, I mean, it's like God, motherhood, and apple pie. I mean, it's ideology, lies, and deception. It's it, people worship the L, the the National Academy. Um, but we have to take a look at what their record is. Well, William Russell, he's just a a mass of confusions. But we know one thing: he makes mistakes, he's dishonest, and he does cover ups. Okay, he's a smart guy, he's a great researcher, but guess what? He's got some flaws. Scientific community and the toxicology community got the LNT question wrong. They still have it wrong. Self-interest and scientific misconduct led to the LNT. All errors, deceptions, mistakes, they're all given a pass. They're still given a pass. They're given a pass by the media. They're given a pass by the leaders of all organizations that are associated with this. They're given a pass by the U.S. EPA. The scientific Toxicology and regulatory communities, in my opinion, have failed in their oversight, their review, and leadership. I mean, it's just as simple as that. Now, this is also important, and it's very critical because it's a history of LNT and the bottom line. What is the role of the Journal of Science in this? Science is like the National Academy. They're like the top of the heap, right? Everybody worships the National Academy in science. You genuflect and you have to kiss their ring, right? So science published four key papers that were deceptive. The Muller paper, 27, without data in peer review. The Uphoff and Stern, 1949, with no methods, analysis, and data, and a fundamentally flawed design. Yet it's used as the basis for Bear one Then we have the Bear one genetics panel. They, what, they misrepresent the scientific record, and they publish their paper in science. They should all have lost their jobs over this, right? Edward B. Lewis, uh, in his 1957 paper, has shown to have no credibility whatsoever. I mean, none. Science journalists had a major role in the acceptance of the incorrect and fraudulent history of LNT. And I think that, that there should be an award for that, right? I mean, it just shows you how powerful uh, organizations are, and they can get away with everything. So final perspectives on LNT. Entire regulatory programs and public education activities are based upon such deceptive historical practices. 
And they involved the National Academy of Science, the science journal Science, and prominent leaders in the radiation genetics community. It's our history. This is actually our history. The EPA has served as an unwitting vehicle to implement such scientific deceptions. Why? Due to its failure to both explore the historical foundations of cancer risk assessment, much of which occurred prior to its creation, and then to take actions to correct the errors once the ramifications were understood. It's like they reinforce each other. So that's my story, and I'm sticking by it. And I think that there is a profound uh, documentation for this. And for those who are interested, there's a 22-episode documentary that has been uh, released by the Health Physics Society on this. It's 10 hours if you can handle an hour and a half to two hours by me now. It's uh, five times as long, <laughs> but, but, it, uh, but it's a dialogue and so forth. But, but yeah, it's a big story. It needs to get out there. And uh, happy to have had this opportunity to to share it with you today. Okay, thank you very much for doing that. And I will put a link to that uh, series of videos in the show description. And as usual, I'll put a link to your uh, all of your slides on my Substack page. What do you think we're doing in America that we shouldn't be doing uh, if we had a better understanding of uh, your work? Well, I actually think that everything is fair game. Everything that I say is fair game, but we have to understand our history. We actually have to understand what our past is and how it has influenced our thinking. And until we are self-reflective and to understand how we ended up where we are, we're not going to really get ourselves aligned properly. So, yes, I have I have my ideas for what I think is the, the most scientifically supported dose response. That's laid out in episode 22 of the the document, uh, you know, documentary. And I but nonetheless, I'm, I'm open to. Uh, Let's go forward and fight this out on a scientific basis with other models. Let's see who wins. Yeah, I, th I think that we should not be afraid to look in the mirror and to try to understand our past and to try to put it in perspective because we have been duped by our leaders and, and, and we've been duped by multiple generations of leaders, people that we have, we have cherished, respected, given the highest honors of humanity to, and other factors and institutions like that. And we're finding that, guess what? They're flawed because why? Because they're human. And we actually have to hold everybody, including ourselves, accountable. Everything that I say, everything that they say, it's all supposed to be accountable. And, uh, and then defend what you have to say instead of giving passes to people because of what? Because they got a Nobel Prize? Because they're the president of the National Academy? Because they're the journal science, right? It means it means that that they're a bit excluded from criticism. No, they have even more responsibility. And what I think this story shows is that they've failed in so many ways. Very good. So thanks again for being on the uh, podcast, and I hope to talk to you again on here later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. All right. Edward Calabrese.